So why am I talking about mental and physical wellness? You might think this is an odd topic for a professor of finance to speak about. Well, those of you who came to my first lecture will have seen this uh, framework on time management by Stephen Covey in his book, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And my point was to focus on items that are important even if they are not urgent. And two of those are exercise and rest, which is the mental and physical wellness part of this talk. But you might think, well, even if these are important topics, why would you want to listen to me about these? Right? I'm not an exercise scientist. I'm not a personal trainer. I'm not a mental health practitioner. And I have to admit, yeah, my knowledge on some of these things is, is much lower than a professional. So what I did over the summer is to read up a lot on the science behind exercise and mental well-being. But I have to recognize that that still doesn't make me an expert. Just by reading a few books, I'm not going to claim to be an expert. But why I hope to be able to give you some novel angles is based on three reasons. So the first is I've experienced the challenges of incorporating mental and physical well-being in a busy working schedule. For example, when I was a junior investment banker at Morgan Stanley and there was a lot of pressure to work the whole time, I was able to still do things such as run the London Marathon or row the head of the river. So the challenges of putting them into practice I hope to share with you. The second is I have actually no genetic ability for, for exercise. So I have beta thalassemia traits, which means I have a lower blood cell count, which is something which will genetically predispose me against long distance running. I also have flat feet, which was also not something good for, for running marathons. And we often think that uh, you're either born a, an athlete or not. But as I hopefully uh, convinced some of you who came to my public speaking lecture last time, you're not born a public speaker, you can develop it. And similarly, me, despite not having any natural genetic athletic ability, this is now a big part of my life. And then third, in terms of my academic work, some of this is on behavioral economics. In fact, my third and final public lecture series next year will be on the psychology of finance and investing. And I'm going to be using some of the insights for behavioral economics in order to think about how to put this into practice. Now, how am I going to start? is I'm going to first start by talking about the benefits of exercise before talking about how to put them into practice. And you might think, well, why am I having this as a starting point? Well, we all know that exercise is good. Shouldn't I move immediately on into the techniques to put it into practice to use the, the Nike strategy of just do it? But the reason why I think it's useful to spend 15 minutes or so on the importance of exercise is that I want to convince you that it's even more important than one might think. So there's lots of things in life that are important. That's why we're all so busy people. With an extra hour, we could learn another language. We could try to upskill and learn about fintech. We can spend that extra hour in the office. We could spend that extra hour with family and friends. Those are all good uses of the extra hour. So what I want to start by emphasizing is why exercise might be even more important than you previously thought. And so that extra hour, or maybe even that extra 15 minutes, might be spent productively exercising while there might be many other things you could have done with that time. And you probably already know that there are many physical benefits of, of exercise. So it reduces the, the chance of illnesses and heart attacks, and it helps you lose weight and so forth. I'm not going to have any unique angle on that. Instead, I'm going to focus exclusively on the mental benefits of exercise and how it affects business effectiveness, linking with the theme of the talk. This is a Gresham business lecture. And that's to say, even if your only goal in life is to be successful in your career, and you don't care about the health benefits of exercise, then you should still consider exercise because it can make you effective in the workplace. So I'm going to narrow myself down into those benefits. I'm going to start by talking about the neurological benefits of exercise, how this affects your brain. And then I'm going to go on into the practical mental benefits that come from that. But I'm going to start with the neurology just to show you there's some science behind this. I'm not just making up stuff which sounds good. And one of the many books I, I read on this topic is a book called Spark by Dr. John Ratey, which is on the neurological benefits. And, and that, I thought, was a very good way of, of, um, of, of laying this out to a non-expert. So if you're interested in it in more detail, that's a, a useful reference. 
So what do I mean by the neurological benefits? So what I talked about in my time management lecture, lecture one, is the idea of the brain being neuroplastic. That's the idea that your brain isn't fully formed when you're adult and then it just stays there and then it just atrophies in old age. Even as an adult, we can still keep shaping the brain. I talked about the idea of a brain being like a muscle and I talked about time management. If we focus on something, we build that mental muscle and we're able to keep focusing in the future. And that's why I talked about the importance of not being distracted by social media or by phones and so forth. But that muscle analogy is imperfect for the following reason. With a muscle, the only way to exercise that muscle is to do an exercise targeted on that muscle. For example, to strengthen your biceps, the only thing you can do is bicep curls. Right, doing squats is not going to help you strengthen your biceps. Whereas with the brain, what's interesting is that the way that you can improve your brain capacity is not just by doing mental exercises, such as focusing for long periods without digital distractions. It's also through doing exercise. And this is where some of the really exciting research is. So I'll go through these relatively quickly because hopefully you'll get the picture. But I have a lot of links here because that's to show that it's backed by science. It is when you're exercising, you're increasing blood flow through the brain. That, that sounds good, but why is that good? Well, that carries oxygen, which converts glucose to adenosine triphosphate, or ATP, and that helps the cells grow and, and, and gives um, you, you energy. And what the book Spark talks about is uh, when you're exercising, it sprinkles brain-derived neurotrophic factor over the brain. You might think, well, what is BDNF? That's something he calls like the miracle grow for the brain. What it leads to is neurogenesis, the formation of new um, brain cells. And not only are more cells formed, but there's myelination, so there's, greater, there's thicker myelin sheaths which cause them to connect more strongly and fire better with each other. And this, typically, um, this is particularly the case in the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain which is responsible for memory and learning. So when you're exercising, not only are you improving yourself physically, but also mentally as well. And interestingly, this is not just in children and adults, but also the elderly. And so it's not that only when we're young is the brain neuroplastic. This is something that has an effect throughout a person's life cycle. So one of many studies that I could have quoted is one which looked at um, sedentary old people. And they had one group hit the gym for one hour a week, three times a week. Now, if you looked at that and just showed that there was an improvement, we, could know, we don't know whether it's correlation or causation. It could be just doing any activity leads to an improvement in the brain. So they compare this to a control group who also took that time away and instead did stretching, which has good benefits, but these benefits were not as strong as uh, hitting the gym. Not only did the first group experience an increase in VO2 max, which is the body's ability to carry oxygen, but actually an increase in brain volume as well, so there were mental benefits of this. Okay. Now, Another benefit is that it stresses the body. You might think, well, that's strange, right? Don't we think of stress being a, a negative thing? Well, what um, the body is designed for is something known as homeostasis, or if you're an economist like me, you'd call this equilibrium. So the brain likes to respond and go back to an equilibrium state. So if we're hot, we sweat, and that cools us down. And that's really important for survival. But there's obviously a, a limit to which the body can respond to external pressure and go back to equilibrium. If things are really cold, then you, you will freeze. Now, that's, that's all positive. But one of the negative things is that humans don't need a clear and present danger to elicit a stress response. So, for example, just looking to the future and seeing, oh, I've got this exam coming up or this difficult meeting coming up, that is something that causes a stress response. So a lot of stress is caused by anxiety about the future. And so what exercise teaches you is because exercise stresses the body, it leads to an elevated heart rate and faster breathing and so forth, 
if indeed the body is subject to these stresses, but actually responds to them and, and finds that these are not actually negative, then indeed when we have these stressful situations, then they don't actually trigger a panic attack. People are associating mild challenges and sort of an elevated heart rate with things such as uh, challenge and growth. And again, this is not just something that sounds good, but people have looked at some evidence to try to back it up. So there was one group of students which ran at 60 to 90% of their maximum heart rate for 20 minutes, six times a week for two weeks. Others just walked, and the first group was less sensitive to anxiety. Again, the idea being they were more used to mild stresses to the body. And finally on this, um, it's the idea that it increases the neurotransmitters which are typically targeted by antidepressants. So things like ser serotonin and endorphins, this, these are released during exercise. And so the feeling that we get of runners high after exercising, this has a, 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 um, an underlying basis to it. You are actually releasing more of these. And again, studies show that these are better than, say, antidepressants like Zoloft at treating depression. Okay, so those are all the neurological benefits, and I'm going to quickly go, I'm going to soon go into putting it into practice. Before doing so, I'd like to talk about the mental benefits of exercise. So we've got all of these changes which are happening to the brain. How might this make you a more effective person in a business context? Again, the reason why I'm saying this is even if your only goal is to be more effective in business, why exercise might be useful. So the first is the importance of, of focus. So as I mentioned at the start, right, if we want to improve focus, there's one way of doing things is by taming digital distraction and getting the brain to concentrate at work. But also, what are we doing when we're doing any exercise of a, any reasonable period? We are focusing on one thing. So chess players, and I used to be an England junior international in chess, used to run and swim for long periods. You might think, why do we do that? Like, chess is not a physically demanding sport, but it's a mentally demanding sport. You need to focus on this for, um, for a couple of hours. And so without that exercise and without that focus, then people can get easily distracted. Now, probably very few people here are chess players, but many people in this room, well, will have jobs where you need to focus on long periods of time. And the same focus that you develop when running and tempted to rest but you're not, or maybe going through some, some sets in weight training and you're tempted to, to, to give up and take things easy but you don't, that all builds focus and that helps you to get through a difficult problem at work or to, do, to spend hour, an hour on a presentation when you might think, well, let me just check my email within 10, 10, 10 minutes. Okay? And again, there's a study on that. Exercise helps executive control which is children ignoring distractions. Now, I'm going to talk about um, three closely related things in terms of the effect on empowerment and what I call the growth mindset, which is going to be lecture six here, which is exercise is something that because it leads to improvement, then this gives you the idea of empowerment or what some people call self-efficacy, that you can improve situations and work and skills at work. For example, if through exercise, you can see yourself running faster or running for longer distances or lifting heavier, this teaches the growth mindset, the idea that we may not have gifts naturally um, genetically, but we can develop them through hard work. And then that empowers people to think, well, maybe I'm not a natural public speaker, but maybe that's something that I can develop. I'm not a networker, but I can develop that. I'm a salesperson, I'm not a salesperson, but I can develop these sales skills. And again here, there's, there's evidence on, on this, is that uh, after a two-month exercise program, subjects smoked less, drank less, ate more healthily, and curbed impulse spending. Because before, you might think, I just happen to be a smoker or an alcoholic and so on, but through seeing the developments in exercise, they were able to take control of those situations and lead to these positive outcomes. And you might think, well, why is exercise unique at this? Because there's many things that you can invest your time in and develop. Right in the last lecture, I talked about the importance of public speaking. And I talked about how you can develop that later. And if you become a better public speaker, 
doesn't that then empower you to think that I can become a better negotiator? Well, what exercise has is the combination of long-term benefits, but also short-term milestones, what economists call leading indicators. So the long-term benefits of exercise in terms of the less likelihood of, of illnesses in the future, they will happen in, in many years. But in the short term, you can see yourself lifting more heavily, faster running times or longer running distances. So even in the short term, there is a tangible payoff and you can see the improvement, even though the benefits in terms of not getting diabetes, that might not manifest for, for, for 10 or 20 years time. If you contrast that with public speaking, right, there are long term benefits of that, you will improve. But also, as I stressed at the start of last lecture, the development in terms of public speaking comes in fits and starts. Right? You don't progress gradually. You might plateau for a long time, and then suddenly you make a step change, and then you plateau. That's not the true with exercise. Right? Nobody goes from lifting 10 kilos to lifting 30 kilos. You'll go from 10 to 12.5 to 15 and 17.5. And so what's useful is that while there are the same long-term benefits that you would get in public speaking, you do have those short-time milestones because the progress tends to be gradual rather than something which is in fits and starts, and that's where it can lead to a greater feeling of empowerment. In contrast, there are other things with, with short-term milestones which might not have long-term benefits. So let's say, okay, I play computer games, I can hit a new high score, right? There, there's some short-term milestones, but that doesn't have the same long-term benefits as exercise. Maybe there's some benefits in terms of dexterity and coordination, but not as strongly. And so that's why I think is a particularly useful thing to teach you empowerment or, or self-efficacy. Okay, so that's one positive, is that it teaches you that you can, you can achieve um, results and you can achieve personal development in the workplace. The flip side to that is ownership and personal accountability, is that if you don't achieve something, then this is your fault and you might take responsibility. So going back to business, which is the theme of the lectures, at work, you might not get something that you hoped for. You might not get a promotion. You might not get a deal, even though you pitch for it. And it's really tempting, and I do this myself, it's tempting to blame external circumstances, to say you gave a great pitch, but um, the, the client was just um, made a bad decision, or they made the assignment based on nepotism, they gave it to somebody that they went to university with. And it's true that in life, there are many things outside your control, and there's luck, it might be just bad luck. But we, including me, we always over-attribute failures to bad luck when some of this should be attributed to ourselves. This is something known as the attribution bias. And again, why I think exercise is useful is it teaches you this accountability so that if you do not win the pitch, rather than blaming the client for making a bad decision, you're going to be more likely to look back at the pitch and say, actually, this could have been a bit better. This was actually not so convincing. And so for this, I think one thing which is useful is individual sport. Now, in my second lecture on um, choosing a career, I talked about the benefits of team sport. But what's good about individual is that this is something where there's huge accountability. So let's say you're running a race and your goal is to do a 10K within 50 minutes or something, and you don't achieve this. You can't blame your teammates. You can't blame the referee. There was no refereeing decision. It's you who probably didn't train hard enough. And so not only can we see the progress, right? We're lifting heavier, we're running faster as part of our own efforts. That was the point that I just made on the last slide. But also, we don't achieve something. Well, this exercise mindset says, well, maybe we could have put more effort into this. And then that can also translate into the workplace and mean that if there's a failure, we're going to use this as a learning process, even though it is really tempting to blame external circumstances. Um, so actually, one of my own um, co fitness coaches, a guy called Louis Rennox, who now teaches at uh, Jab Box, he said, fitness is the hardest thing to get because only you can get it. You can't inherit it. You can't win the lottery. You can't buy it. You have to work for it. 
And so that's empowering, right? Because it means that it's something that you can acquire. But it's also something which, which causes you to be accountable because if you fail to acquire it, right, it's something that you didn't put the effort into and that teaches you accountability with, with many other things. Stuart Pearce, the former England football captain, who worked his way up from an electrician and a semi-pro footballer to becoming captain of England, he said you can find a million and one excuses in life if you want to. I like the excuse, it is my fault, I'm going to do something about it, that's a mentality you get through exercise, and it's something which is really useful to translate into the workplace. Okay, I'm not going to go through everything here, just in the interest of time. Let me just go through, actually, the penultimate thing here in terms of overcoming fear of failure and living boldly. Is that whenever you have exercise, and again, the benefit of it is you've got quantitative metrics, unlike other good things like playing music or public speaking, is that sometimes you might fail. So it might be you've got a target time for your 10K, you don't get this. Or uh, maybe you're playing a, a, a match and, and you'll lose. And I think getting used to failure is, is very important because this is something which is an aspect of, of life. So the top baseball teams in the US, they win 60% of games, so they lose two games in every five. The top batters will only hit the ball successfully three-tenths of the time. And so if you're used to an activity where there is are, are failures, where you don't achieve your goals, then that actually encourages you that there is nothing wrong with failure. That's just part of life. And if you're not failing, you're probably setting your goals too low. And actually, the way in which society evolves tends to say failure is a really bad thing. Whether if, if a child sort of strikes out in baseball, he or she will say, I just wasn't trying. Right, they don't want to admit that they tried and they failed, but this is something that we actually would like to, to be comfortable with. For example, it may be that you volunteer to give a presentation in class. Sometimes that presentation won't go well. Or maybe you'll pitch for a business or you'll apply for a job and then you're going to get rejected. But if we're not comfortable with failure, then maybe we're only going to pitch for the business that we think that we're going to win or we're only going to apply for jobs that we think that we're going to get. But once we accept that failure is, is, is part of life, then this will encourage us to be more ambitious. So there's a book called The Road Less Travelled by M. Scott Peck, which um, some of you will have heard of, where one of the most memorable lines for me is, once you realise that life is difficult, then life is no longer difficult. Right, failure is just a consequence of setting goals that are challenging. And if you don't fail, then you're not setting yourself challenging enough goals. So let's then go now into, as promised, putting it into practice. But hopefully the goal of my first 20 minutes is to show that actually the benefits of exercise are even stronger than you might think. And then number two is that once we have recognised what the benefits are, then we can design a regime that capitalizes on those benefits, which is why I wanted to start with that uh, precursor. Now, what I'm going to use is a, a framework that I learned from the Behavioral Insights team. So who are they? They are colloquially known as the Nudge Unit. They were set up by David Cameron to um, nudge and to use behavioral economics to lead to more pro-social behavior. And you might have heard of some nudges by them or by other people in TED Talks by the likes of Dan Ariely. For example, if we want to get people to donate their organs, we change the system so it's opt-outs rather than opt-in. So things like that. And so what they came up with was an acronym, um, which is EAST, is that if we want to encourage good behaviours, these must be easy, attractive, social, and timely. Now, timely doesn't really apply here. Timely is on, on a government implementing a programme rather than a citizen doing it herself. So I'm going to focus on the easy, the attractive, and the social elements of this. So let's start with easy. So what's the best way in terms of getting yourself to exercise more? It's to choose something easy and, and convenient and make it the default. Now, that might sound obvious. Right? You might think, I didn't need to come to the lecture to think about making something easy. But actually, many people think, well, 
what should I be doing? Should I be doing um, spinning or body pump or CrossFit or running? And they might look at the website and sort of compare the number of calories burned and so forth. But notice none of that was in what I spoke about for the last 20 minutes in terms of which is going to be burn more calories. If you think about the mental benefits, anything that will cause you some stress and has some progress will cause those, those benefits that I spoke about. So rather than overanalyzing sort of which out of all of those has the best in terms of calorie burn, what is the most convenient in terms of what's closest to your office or what's closest to work? Um, because of the first bullet point here is the idea of consistency and intensity. So often when we're trying to think about a new exercise regime or a new habit, we think about let's try to make it as intense as possible. I'm going to exercise every day for an hour a day for seven, for seven days a week, or I'm going to practice my new instrument or learn a new language again for an hour a day for the entire every day a week. But that's contrast with consistency, which is what is something that I'm going to be able to maintain. And so here it might be that you're going to choose something which has a slightly lower calorie burn, but because it's close to your office or close to your work, you're going to do it. Or because it's fun, you're going to do it. And that's an important part of easy. Again, um, when I talked about the, 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 the benefits previously, I didn't do a calorie comparison. What matters is that you do something and that gives you all the benefits that, that we mentioned earlier. Also, how do we make it easy? Is to add it to our schedule. So people will have things like personal trainers or group exercise classes, and there you would clearly need to put it on your schedule. And once something is in your schedule, you do it, right? We're good at sort of keeping things into your, our schedules, schedule things sort of get prioritized. However, not everybody can afford a personal trainer. Not everybody can afford a group class. So maybe for you, your exercise might be, I'm gonna go and run outside. Or maybe I'm just gonna do some stretching at home and so on. But I would say that even if it's an individual workout, you should still add it to your schedule because that makes it easy, right? That is going to block out that time in your calendar and make sure you do it, because if you don't, then something else is going to come into that time and is going to crowd that out. It also means that it doesn't, it means that you don't waste time before the workout. So let's say I have programmed, let's say it's 10 a.m. in the morning, and I've programmed, I've put in my schedule, I'm going to go for a run at 10.30. Now, the time between 10 and 10.30, I'm probably not going to be wasting time checking social media. Why? I know that I'm going to go for the run at 10.30, so I need to finish what I'm going get, to get done beforehand. If instead I'm going to think, well, I'm going to go for my run as soon as I finish this presentation, then it may be that I just take as long as I want to on that presentation, so I take some time and I take a break and just check some email and go back to the presentation, where scheduling something, one of the benefits of this is not only are you doing the activity, but also in the run-up to the activity, you'll be more productive. Why? Because you're going to, you know that you've got this, um, this thing which is going to break up your schedule. Okay. Also linked to this is the idea of just small things um, are going to make a, a, a big difference. For example, let's say just taking the stairs at work, once you do that once or a couple of times, you then become an autopilot. And again, this is something which has a neurological basis, is that when you're doing something for the first few times, this takes a conscious decision from the brain and is difficult. After making something a habit, it just gets imprinted in the basal ganglia of the brain, and then it happens just automatically. So again, the, the trick to making something easy is to make it a habit. So even if it is a small thing, if the brain is an autopilot, knowing I'm going to always take the stairs or every Saturday morning I'm going to go to this fitness class, that is something which really does move the needle. And even if it's not the most intense thing, the fact that you're going to be consistent at something easy is going to outweigh that. OK, so the second thing I'm going to talk about is attractive. So choose something fun I've already mentioned, but you can also enhance the attractiveness of a particular exercise regime with some of these um, things here. So one of them is you could add additional rewards during the exercise, and importantly, only have those rewards being enjoyed during the exercise activity and not anywhere else. 
Let me give you an example. That sounded a bit abstract. So one of my former colleagues at Wharton, um, called Katie Milkman, she wrote a, a very famous paper called Holding the Hunger Games Hostage at the Gym. Why was it called that? Like, she loved to listen to audiobooks, and she hated to go to the gym. So what she did is she kept her audiobook only in her gym locker. So that meant that the only way that she could listen to the audiobook was to go to the gym, and this is something she called temptation bundling. She was bundling something which was tempting to her with also something which was personally sort of costly in terms of um, difficult, which is to go to the gym. And this, when she did a large scale experiment, those who engaged in that, they were actually able to engage in better behavior in terms of exercising more. It might be that you could add additional rewards after um, actually doing the exercise. Uh, for example, you could go choose to go with friends and have a so, say we're going to meet for coffee afterwards. For me, I go to a really like difficult workout called Barry's Boot Camp, where during the hour you're completely beasted by by the coach. What I always have is that in my in my um, locker afterwards, I have a fruit shake which I've made at home with my Nutribullet. Now. I've made that as attractive as possible. It is sitting in my locker, and therefore I can have it immediately on my way home. Now, you might think, well, why don't I just make it at home when I've got home and, it's, and then it's really fresh? But then it's no longer attractive because I need to put the effort in to making it. Whereas here, I know that immediately after I finish the difficult workout, I've got this reward for me. And those rewards are also really important in terms of habit formation. Some of you will know the book, The Power of Habit, by Charles Duhigg, where he talked about, well, how did Febreze get people to, to clean their homes uh, more effectively? Right? There was a great cleaning solution that they had, but even though it got rid of all of the germs, people didn't use it. But it was only when they added a scent afterwards that people started to use the, 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 the cleaning solution why? Because the housekeepers or, or, or the house owners liked the positive smell afterwards because they felt they'd have achieved something. And so to here, just adding a few things can make something more attractive. And all finally, if we think about the idea of focus, remember that was, what was one of the mental benefits. If we are indeed engaging in exercise, then we're focusing on something, and that means that then at work we are not getting distracted. But what's key to this? is to, to make sure that we completely focus during exercise. So you might see many people in the gym who between sets are going to be checking their emails. That makes exercise less attractive because it means it's not a break from work because you're on your email. I used to go running in Hyde Park, and then as soon as the run was over, rather than enjoying and soaking up the endorphins of the run, I would be just checking my iPhone. Why did I have my iPhone? Because I listen to music when I run. And you might think, well, why do people in the gym check their email? Because they're listening to music as well. But there's an easy solution to this, right? Just buy a portable MP3 player. So what I did is I bought for about £20 um, something which can only play music, and I can't check my um, emails on. And that's what I take to the gym, and that's what I take when I run. And so that means that when I'm doing this, I know that I have an hour of me time where I'm going to be away from text messages and emails, and I think that's really powerful. That makes it even more attractive for me. I know that's time, some time that I have to myself. Okay, so, um, and let's go to the, the final one, um, which is social, is that whenever something involves other people, then you're more likely to do this, and this is part of the, the research from behavioral economics. And so here, I'm going to um, highlight the importance of, of group exercise is doing something with other people. So it used to be that I would go to the gym and that had some benefits, but there were some costs for that. It was mentally really taxing, is that every day, even after a long day at work, I have, I'd have to go and I'd have to motivate myself. And also I would do the same thing every time I had sort of this, the same routine that I, I would be doing. But then from a group exercise class, there's many benefits. So number one is there's studies showing that people's serotonin levels rise whenever they're doing group activities. This is the idea of a hub. When you're surrounded by other people doing similar things, there is a, just a, a, a benefit which causes everybody to perform more strongly. That's why on the flip side, people like to work 
fucking libraries. But if you're surrounded by other studious people, then you're more likely to, to, to focus on your work. Similarly, you could have watched this lecture at home and, and live stream, but you probably would not be focusing to the same degree as you are here, surrounded by other people. But I think well, some of the other benefits of anything within a group situation is you can delegate motivation and design to an expert. And this expert here is the coach. So any coach there, right, they are the people who are responsible for motivating you and designing the program. I can myself, again, have that hour of time where I'm not having to mentally motivate myself. And again, why did I come up with this? It goes back to what are the benefits of exercising to begin with are the mental benefits. And I'm maximizing them by delegating the design and motivation to somebody else. I'm only focusing on the physical exertion. Mentally, I am free for that hour. Okay, so that's everything that I had in terms of physical fitness. Again, let me stress, like I said a lot in sort of 35 minutes, number one, there's many benefits of this way beyond just the physical. This helps you be more effective at work. And number two is in order to capitalize on this, make it easy, make it attractive, make it uh, social, consistency beats intensity. If something is easy, attractive and social, it's gonna be in your routine and you're gonna do this um, on a regular basis. Let me now move to the mental wellness aspect of this. And so if you go back to the um, matrix I had at the start, right? I said exercise and rest. Rest is important, but not urgent. And it's something that for many of us is the residual. What we have our work, we have our family commitments, we have to clean our house and so forth, and rest is what's left at the end. And if we're really busy, we're not gonna rest because there's nothing left. So if this is something which does not get prioritized, it will always be squeezed out because it's the residual. And so it's something we need to prioritize. Um, as a New York Times article stressed, it takes work to stop working. So unless we put this into our schedule, we're not going to do it. And what's worrying is that society scorns rest. So anybody who's resting, is said to be sort of lazy. Many people will boast about the idea of getting by on very little sleep. Now, for me, this is crazy because sleep is something essential, just like food and water. Nobody, to my knowledge, boasts about getting by on less food or less water than other people. If you're not consuming that, you're either dehydrated or malnourished. And similarly, if we think about sleep and rest as something that, oh, I'm able to get by less, on there's probably going to be some long-term consequences, just like dehydration and, and malnutrition. So these are why these are important things to, to emphasize. So how do we do this, right? Because we think, okay, we all know this is important, but the reality of life is we're really busy. So uh, how do we um, put this into practice? Now, one of the things that I spoke about a lot in lecture one is on time management and the importance of saying no and in particular, how we can say no to far more things than we think we can, even if you're a junior employee and you think you need to accept all pieces of work. Now, I'm not gonna re-go over all of that because that was in lecture one, but I'd encourage you to look at that time management in the digital age if you haven't seen it. The only point I'm gonna add in this lecture is this final one about each day should be a gift. So what do I mean by this? Every day when you wake up, you are lucky because many people did not wake up this morning, did not wake up today. And so there's many people who, who, who will look at their calendar and think, I just have to get through the day. And that is not a good place to be in because it means that this day is not a gift, this day is punishment. Now, for many people in the world, millions of people in the world, that is unfortunately the reality is that there's many people who are malnourished and hungry and it is about survival and getting through the day. But for us, we are in a privileged position, is that most days right, we do have discretion in terms of what we're gonna do, and it shouldn't just be about looking at the day and just um, dreading it. But for me, that used to be the case. Well, I would pack so much into my schedule, put in so many meetings or client visits and so on, that it would just be about getting through the day, and then that would be something which would be extremely bad in terms of my mental wellness. So just to go back to one point I made about five minutes ago, but what matters is not just the activity when you're doing it, 
but what's leading up to that activity. And indeed, what causes stress is not just the activity itself being stressful, but anticipating that stress. And similarly, what this emphasises here is to try to make sure that we say no to sufficient things, that we don't have a day being so packed that it's not going to be a gift, that when we wake up in the morning, we're not thankful for the day ahead of us. Okay, so what are a few other um, couple of uh, important things to put this into practice is the importance of maintaining and cultivating outside interest. So again, this might seem obvious, but let me uh, emphasise why I think it's even more important than one might have thought before. Is that if we have other things be besides work, then it means that work does not drive your emotions, right? Again, in work, it may be that you don't get a promotion, you don't get a mandate, you don't get some business, and if that's the only thing that, that's there, then it can be ex extremely negative, and then if that's the only thing that drives our emotions, then our emotions will be on a roller coaster because we're dependent upon other people's approval. But if instead we have other things which are within our control, let's say progress towards running faster, or progress towards learning a language, or progress towards being a better public speaker, but those give us other things, they sort of take back control over our life, that means that part of our happiness is not just our success at work, but our success in those other activities. And those other success in our other activities gives us um, some control, which means that we're not at the behest of other people's decisions. And also, going back to the idea of anticipation, is that when I was an, an assistant professor of finance at Wharton, where you're supposed to work all the time in order to get tenure, I would do exercise virtually every day. So often it might be an ice hockey game, later at uh, maybe 9 p.m. We used to play late because the ice time was cheap. But then I, when I'd work during the day, I'd be really productive because I knew I had something to look forward to, which is the ice hockey game. If I didn't have that, then again, it would be a day which would not be a gift because I would think this day is a day I just need to get as much research done as possible. It is a day of grind. But by putting something else in the day, that day did seem a gift because it meant, oh, I've got some work to do, but I've got something to look forward to afterwards. And again, the joy of that ice hockey game was not only the hour that I spent on the ice, but all of the anticipation leading up to it, which meant that it was a day to look forward to. Okay, so um, a couple of other things, again, from um, behavioral economics is to plan your rest time. So again, we think about rest being the residual, so that when we have rest, we don't know what to do with it. It just appears if, if we manage to get our work done early, we've got maybe eight hours on, on a Sunday. Now, what's the, the positive thing about work is that it's structured, right? You've got meetings or you've got presentations to prepare for the meeting, and it's stretching, it's difficult, and this leads to what's known as a flow state. I referred to this a few um, lectures ago by Mahali, Sixth Cent Mahali. So flow is a state that you're in where when you're doing something, time just passes, right? you are, are, are immersed in, in a particular activity. And that you can be with work. But often, actually, with, with rest time, um, it's unstructured, and studies of people's happiness have actually found that people are less happy in rest time than they are at work time, which seems bizarre, but it's because you're not in a flow state. If, if, if rest time is unstructured, then people will often default to, to social media. So one can think about planning your rest time as deliberately as planning your, your work time. Now, that doesn't mean that rest time needs to be something active. You could plan to sit and read a book or sit in the cafe or sleep during the rest time, but make sure that what you're doing is something which is deliberate. And this doesn't mean that you have to always be structured and you can never go with the flow. It could be that your rest time ends up watching TV. But again, to think about when you're, you're doing this, if you're choosing to watch TV, that is a discretionary decision rather than something you're doing by default because you're chain watching after um, several hours of watching something else. So again, what I like to think about is that if I have rest time is that these are maybe my eight hours on a Sunday, which I've worked the entire week in order to do. Am I using those eight hours as usefully as possible? 
I said, usefully, not productively. I don't need to be doing something active. It could, again, be just chatting with some friends in the pub. But is this how I want to use my time? And if so, then that's a, then, then that's a tick. If it's not something not, that's not, I'd like to shake myself out of the inertia. Then we have that rest time. What's important is to take a complete rest during that rest time. Now, as I've said in some prior lectures, one of my huge hobbies is music. And I thought, I love listening to music. I must listen to hours of music every day. Uh, but actually, what I realised is that I never listened to music. It was background noise. It was something that was playing when I was working out or maybe when I was tidying the house or, or doing the dishes. And so um, there was one of my songs, was, uh, one of my favourite songs is called Drops of Jupiter by Train, which some of you will know, it won a Grammy Award for the Record of the Year. And I always used to think that I knew how this song went. I thought it started like this. Some of you will know the start of the song. So it starts with that piano riff. And I thought I knew the song, it's my favourite song. Um, but then the first time I actually sat and listened to that song was when the band that I played for in Philadelphia, I played keyboards, we needed to learn that song. And so this is the first time I sat down with no other distractions, not running, not doing the dishes and listen to it. And I realised it didn't start like that. I realised that in addition to that piano piece, there's actually a high wind instrument playing at the same time. So let me play that clip again and see whether you can pick out that high wind instrument. So that was exactly the same clip, where I didn't doctor it, but just by listening to it, not hearing it, that clip just became so much richer. And I think about all my whole music library, I've got so many songs, and each time a new album comes out, I want to buy that, but I'd not actually really listened to any of the songs in the music library because they were just background noise. Uh, and similarly, what about eating? Well, I sometimes think it's most efficient to eat when I'm on the tube from a place to another place, sort of eating a sandwich, but just the idea of just sitting down and, and saving every bite. These things might seem small, but this is one of the pleasures of life, eating or listening to music, and these were just relegated to activities I would do simultaneously with everything else. So the message of this is just to be present, to focus on one thing. As a book by Spencer Johnson said, the best present you can give yourself is the present. I'm running out of time and I always want to allow time for questions. So let me skip right on to the end as to what about when things don't go well? How do we stay sane and how can we ensure that we're, we're, we're mentally well through this? And I'm going to skip through this as well, just in the interest of time. I've got another talk on YouTube called Dealing with Success and Dealing with Failure, where you can see this. But instead, I'm going to go through something really new, which I've never presented before. And this is from a best-selling book by, called The Boy, The, the Horse, the, the Fox and the Mole by Charlie Mackersy. This, at the same time as Greta Thun Thunberg's book, were the two bestsellers of last year, according to Waterstones. And here is a picture of a boy and a horse. And for those who can't read it, the boy says to the horse, what's the bravest thing you've ever said? Asked the boy. And the horse says, help. And so what I mean by this is that there are times in which you will find difficulties. Things will not go well. You might be denied the promotion or you might uh, be denied something that you, you, you think that you deserve. How do we respond to these situations? And my advice is to ask for help, is that there's lots of resources around to deal with anxiety, to deal with stress and to deal with depression. So if we're sick, you'd see a doctor. If you want to exercise, you'll see a personal trainer. Why? They are experts. They are professionals who know how to deal with these situations. And similarly, a counsellor, a therapist, a mental health professional, those are all professionals. Why would we want to sort of work through our problems ourselves? We wouldn't self-medicate. We'd go to a doctor. And similarly, for something which is um, a mental issue, we would want to see a professional as well. Um, there was a great TED talk called Why We All Need to Practice Emotional First Aid by Guy Winch. He says, well, you, ne you wouldn't be expected to run on a broken leg, so you shouldn't be expected to suck it up if tired or emotionally broken. 
Now, all these things seem easier said than done. So what I'm going to end with is some stories of how I myself needed to seek help in certain cases. I know this is a public lecture and it's going to be on the web and then there's a stigma to be associated with, with, with seeking help. But I think that these issues are so serious that I think it's much more important for me to get the message out about seeking help than sort of any sort of personal pride in these situations. Now, the first time might not be seem, seem as, as, as too serious. This was a time where I was a first year analyst at Morgan Stanley and I was being overworked. Is that I, I was, I, there were six days in a week where four out of those six finishes were at 4 a.m. Now, the temptation there was to suck it up, right? As a first year analyst, you need to be working hard because those are the people who are going to get promoted. But this was just so difficult for me, I decided to go to HR and I said, what can I do about this situation or can you talk to my boss? And they said, no, you need something drastic. You should be signed off sick. You do not look well enough to go to work. And I thought, this is really bad. If, if people know that I was the person who went to HR, then the bosses are going to be firing me. But then they were extremely sympathetic. They said, oh, this is a really serious issue. They felt embarrassed that they got to the stage in which I was uh, just, just physically unwell because I was being worked too hard. And so um, they, they had absolutely no problems with me being signed off sick for that week. Now, I thought, let me be a hero, right? OK, after having two days where I had good night's sleep and rest, I went back into the office on the third day. And then on the third day, HR saw me and said, this is really bad. You are signed off as sick. You are signed off as unfit for work. You should not be here for work. So even in an investment bank with a culture, of really long hours, and even on the lowest rung of the ladder, this was something which was taken um, really seriously. Now, you might think, well, that's not mental, mentally um, being mentally ill, that's just overwork. There's no real stigma to say saying you're overworked. So let me just share um, some things now. Is that there was a time a couple of years ago in, in my job where I, I felt uh, dis discrimination and, and harassment, and this wasn't something where there was one big incident. But what um, people call a series of micro moments, small things where certain things are said, which just led to a culture of, of discrimination and bullying. And, and what I did is I, I went to my doctor and then the doctor referred me to a counsellor. And I went through a series of counselling sessions in order to, to work through this. And I, and I loved many aspects of the job. And, and this is why I didn't want to, to quit it. I wanted to stay. And so this is why these resources were useful resources to get me through that, that difficult period. And then um, a, a, about a year later, I then started working with an executive coach. I come with, a, with an executive coach or any sort of therapy, you come with presenting issues. And my two presenting issues were potential burnout and dealing with conflict. And again, my employer provided some paid access to an executive coach in order to work through these difficulties. Some of you might have been at my last lecture on, on um, public speaking, and I started the lecture by saying uh, I, I might not be as effective today as I might normally because I'm actually signed off sick um, from work at the moment. And actually, I was signed off sick uh, not through any physical issue, but through a mental health issue. So there was a situation at work which had caused me um, depression and anxiety. I went to the doctor, and the doctor signed me off sick. I didn't tell many people about this, but I told sort of the, the, the relevant people, this is why I'm not going not, not gonna to be here so that it's all legitimate. But these are all things where if there are some certain difficult things which are happening, these are not things that we need to suffer ourselves. There are lots of resources. There are resources like executive coaches, there's counsellors, there's medical professionals that you can look to. And this is why the, 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 the situation, which is still a difficult, difficult situation, is one that I'm able to get through. And that's why I'm able to, to stand up here and, and, and give a talk where probably none of you knew that I was going through some difficult situations at the moment because these great resources were able to help me through this. Okay, so that's all that I, I have here. Sorry I wasn't able to get through every slide, but I really wanted to allow time for questions. So I, um, please feel free to, to ask about anything that I said, or were there any aspects that um, you hope that I speak about today, which I didn't address, uh, please feel free to, to ask them. Thank you very much for the attention.